Okay, <clears throat> so first greetings to all friends in UKZ in particular and all other friends around. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Bugdal compact sphere bound, gravitational field energy and the scale velocity. Like uh, as Sunil said that uh, I happen to have a very strong link with the, uh, his department. As a matter of fact, this talk uh, actually originated from a, a discussion I had with uh, Ritu some four or five years back. And I thought it is the right time to start with this. Okay, so the next, next slide. So compact next of an object like a star is an important issue in astrophysics. And stars, as we know, are the basic building blocks of health, the structure in the universe. Now the question is how, how compact could it be? Of course, we know that the most compact thing is a black hole. So then question is, how close could one go to a black hole? And the compactness is usually, usually measured by the compactness ratio, m over r, mass over the radius. Now, this would naturally depend upon the fluid interior, its equation of motion, binding energy, other fluid properties. Next. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, a very common sense thing that, uh, how, how will we define a compact object? And that common sense uh, idea is that the one which cannot be compressed any further. Now you let's ask the question is, do we have any solution of the Einstein equation describing this incompressible fluid? And the usual normal answer is the famous uniform density Schwarzschild interior solution. So this is the, actually the limiting equation of state that it cannot be compressed. So can we not get the compactness limit simply by this interior solution? <clears throat> In our usual notation, I'd, I'd, it's the standard things, all these things are known to you. Uh, so you have a cent central pressure you would like to be finite. Uh, density is constant. And the two parameters you have this constant A and B. So A should be greater than equal to B. So as to the proper time detail doesn't become negative of that coordinate time dt. And that determines A greater than equal to B actually translates into M over R less than equal to four by nine. <clears throat> and this is the Bugdahl sphere limit, so Bugdahl's com compactness bound. So this is a very, a, a common sense way of coming uh, getting the Bugdahl compactness limit. Next. <clears throat> now, the story began in 1959 when Bugdahl considered an isotropic perfect fluid interior with density and pressure being positive and density decreasing outward. And of course, the interior is matched to the Schwarzschild exteriors at pressure zero at the boundary. 
under these very general conditions, he obtained the bound M by R less than or equal to four by nine, or otherwise the R greater than or equal to nine by four M, which is greater than two M. So it is slightly larger than the Schwarzschild radius. This bound saturates, that is M over R equal to four by nine, when the central pressure tends to infinity. <clears throat> now, this bound is, gen it's, is also generalized to pure love log theory. Now, what we mean by pure love log? So first, let us see that the love log is a, the most natural higher dimensional generalization of general relativity. It's like X and is a homogeneous polynomial in Riemann tensor. <clears throat> and its most remarkable property is that though the action is polynomial in Riemann, <clears throat> yet the equation of motion, which you get by varying with respect to the metric, still remains second order. No other generalization retains uh, this very important property. And you want second order because you don't want undesirable, undesirable features like ghosts, et cetera. But here we were not saying pure love lock, but we are, we are saying not love lock in general because you have each order comes with a, a, a your comes with a dimensional full coupling constant. By pure love lock, we mean that the action has only one and a third term. It has no sum over the lower orders. And why it has been singled out by two very general basic properties. One, that Einstein theory is kinematic in three dimensions. That is to say, <clears throat> the Riemann curvature is entirely given in terms of Ricci. So Ricci equal to zero implies Riemann zero. You don't have a non-trivial vacuum solution in three dimensions. <clears throat> or other way to say the wild curvature is identically zero. The question is, can we universalize this property? And the answer is yes, the pure level of does this. As the Einstein is uh, n equal to linear order low log n equal to one. So that is to say the three dimension will be two n plus one. So by defining the low log analog of the Riemann tensor, Riem, Lovelock Riemann, when we are able to show that, that there exists no non-trivial vacuum solution in all critical odd dimension, d equal to 2n plus 1, where n is the degree of the uh, Lovelock polynomial. So this only happens only for a pure love log and no other. There is another very physical motivation for this, that any theory of gravity or any long range field theory like Maxwell theory or, or, or gravity, the, there must exist bound orbits around a, around a static object. And if you take this property, then you say that in Einstein theory, the bound orbits can exist only in four dimension and none else. So if you want to go to higher dimension and still if you want to have a bound orbits, then it again uniquely picks out pure level of theory. So that's how we come to the, uh, the pure level. Now, so that, that uh, your 
uh, lim the book down limit M or R is four by nine, it now gets uh, takes this form as in this equation five, where M or R raised to N, because this is the this is the potential is is a nth order here, and N is as defined here d minus two n minus one over n, which is one for d n equal to one d equal to four. Let's go to next next slide. So <clears throat> there have been some alternative derivations of the Buddha limit. The same bound was also obtained for anisotropic fluid by considering that the strong energy condition is satisfied. Matching at the boundary is done by the radial pressure to be zero. And Anderson and uh, these people obtains the same bound and the bound separates for a thin cell where twice the transfer pressure equal to the metal density. <clears throat> when we should see the saturation of always occurs either in the uniform density case where the central pressure goes to infinity or in this case, you have an infinitely thin cell. Next. <clears throat> Uh, no, there should be some, there should be one before this, I guess. Uh, ne next. Uh, yeah, this is the one, yeah. Now you ask what happens when electric charge is introduced. So if that object is a charged object, right, then we all know that that charge introduces as a repulsive part. So the effective gravitational mass becomes M minus Q squared by two R. They're following the same kind of a Bukdal procedure that metal density is decreasing outwards while the charge density is increasing outwards. And that interior is matched to the Reister Nostrum exterior at pressure zero. Now, this was obtained, considered by Giuliani and the Rothman in 2008. They considered a uniform density distribution enveloped by a thin charge cell. And they obtained this beautiful, simple result. The equation seven, that M by R is less than or equal to eight by nine, and then this thing on the down, and where alpha squared is the square root charge to mass ratio. And as expected, it reduces to the Bukdal limit when charge is zero. One interesting thing comes about is, the upper bound on the charge here is nine by eight, which is greater than one. And so a charge object in principle could be overcharged relative to a charged black hole because the charged black hole's extremality is alpha square equal to one. Here, <clears throat> charge can exceed mass, so that's, so now this we obtain. Uh, so th this has been obtained for a charge object, following actually the, the on similar lines as the book does. Next. Alternatively, Anderson uh, considers that various, th this has been done by various people Anderson in particular, for various kinds of distribution that where the uh, fluid distribution is not uniform, and it obtains the equation eight as the 
uh, compactness limit, which again reduces to the Bogdan limit for Q equal to zero. But it has a strange thing that when Q square equal to M square, this goes to M over R raised to one. So in that limiting case, the boundary will become a null boundary concise with the black hole horizon. Now, few things, a couple of points about this uh, limit. One, you see that this is an involved expression. It's not M by R given in terms of a, the charge to mass ratio like alpha square the previous time. It's an in involved equation you have. Secondly, this itself <clears throat> doesn't contain any, any extremal limit. It doesn't restrict charge. You can't say, now here we put the charge to mass ratio only to unity, because you can't go below the, that's where you touch the horizon. So what you want to say here, here the compactness in this, according to this, it extends all the way down to the horizon. And it, that's done. <clears throat> so that's, that's, now this set, this again saturates for a thin cell where the twice transfer pressure equal to the matter density. And it has earlier been also considered this saturation is where rho m, plus Q square by R4, that is the matter density and the density due to the electric field are constant, copper stock and fluorides. Uh, and the, with that demanding that the pressure, central pressure goes to infinity. So the two, two limits are distinct and different. And here we are not concerned about the relative merits of these things. Rather, we would like to come uh, to focus on a new prescription for the Bukdal sphere. Next. <clears throat> so now what, again, you simply ask the question is that without referring to the interior, can we work out the compactness limit? Could exterior solution play a role in determining the compactness bound? And obvious, perhaps you will say that no, because it really depends on internal structure, equation of state, binding energy, etc. However, we do know one thing, the analog of binding energy is gravitational field energy. And because the two are defined similarly, the definition of the two is similar, the total energy minus the matter energy. The total energy contained inside some radius R, subtract the matter energy from this, that will give you the binding energy. The difference is this, the binding energy is evaluated in the inside of the uh, uh, star where the gravitational field energy is outside. And at the boundary to coincide, they to agree. So could one be construed as a reflection of the other? So that's what a question you have. We can, however, ask the simpler question. Let us try to first translate the Bogdal bound in terms of the gravitational field energy. Then you may say that we are on a much slippery ground of uh, gravitational field energy. How do you evaluate gravitational field energy? Because the energy by itself in a general relativity is a very ambiguous, uh, ambiguous quantity, and more so the gravitational field energy. However, there does exist a one very 
had reasonably good and very acceptable definition due to Brown and York. Brown York poses quasi local energy. And in particular, like you have a positive, positive mass uh, theorem, the positivity of the Brown York energy has also been proved by Liu and Tau. Next. <clears throat> So, so what is the brown yolk construction? Consider at a time like three cylinder, cylindrical region bounded at two ends by two surfaces. The total energy contained inside this two, uh, can inside into the, uh, this th uh, three cylindrical, time like three cylindrical region is given by the integral uh, k minus k naught, where k is the extensive curvature, k naught is the extensive curvature of a, some reference space time, say asymptotically flat, the Minkowski space time at uh, uh, infinity. Q is the determinant of the two metric of the two dimensional surface. The two-dimensional surface which is bounding. Now, if this thing, if we evaluate for the Raison Nostrum metric for a charged object, this comes out this equation 10, that energy contained inside a radius r is r minus square root of r square minus 2mr plus q square. Now let us try to see, expand it for a large R and see whether it gives us a reasonable accepted result. So this will be M minus Q square over two R minus M square over two R. So what do you have? So what, what the, the uh, uh, entire picture is in the brown your thing that at infinity, you have a mass which is infinitely dispersed. And that is say, let us say it has a mass M. Under gravity, it collapses. As it, as it collapses, it picks up gravitational energy. So then when you are uh, considering the total energy inside some radius R, then the you have to subtract out the energy, the gravitational energy, which is lying outside of the radius R. So you, what you would expect is, the, at the Newtonian level, you will say the gravitational energy is minus m square over two R. This has to be, to be subtracted from m. So that's why it is in 11, you see it's m plus m square over two R. Now, the electric field energy is opposite. The Q square by 2R is energy which is lying outside because that Q square by 2R, this is the positive. Uh, electric field gives you the positive contribution. So electric field, electro, electric field energy is Q square by 2R and which is subtracted. So at large R, it does give us a an expect, physically ex, expected result that M minus the electrostatic energy plus the contribution from the <clears throat> gravitational field energy. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now once we ha have this, so now since I have a total energy contained in this, now I can obtain the gravitational field energy will be the total energy contained inside the uh, in, in, inside the radius R, subtract from it the matter energy, that is the non gravitational energy. So E dy minus E matter, so which is your the E by is the first two terms. And the mat matter part is this. This is a non gravitational energy, m minus q, t, q square by 2r. So this gives 
as a good measure of gravitational field energy for a spheric, static spherical object. Next. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, so let's say, where does we, uh, we first use this gravitational field energy? So let's consider the, can we define the black hole horizon in terms of the gravitational field energy? And it was long back I had uh, propose this, that the horizon is defined when the gravitational field energy is equal to the non-gravitational matter. There is an equipartition between gravitational and non-gravitational field energy defines the black hole and horizon. And let us verify this for the uh, charged uh, object. So you uh, so on the left hand side, this is what we have computed earlier that your, is your uh, gravi gravitational field energy. On the right is the matter energy. So you have this. Now, this equipartition, the two are equal only at the horizon that defines the horizon R plus as M over one plus one. Uh, square root of one minus alpha, uh, alpha square. So, so this definition works very well. It is that, that the black hole horizon is defined with the equipartition of gravitational and non-gravitational. As earlier case, this also we have been able to generalize is to pure love of gravity. Next. <clears throat> But how do we understand it? Why, what does this equipartition physically mean? Why should we accept this? And for that, the physical reason is that the ordinary time-like particles feel the gravitational attraction grad phi, which is produced by the non-gravitational energy, it's matter energy. While the photons, on the other hand, they can feel no grad phi. They only feel the space curvature. And the space curvature is produced by the gravitational field. Easy, yeah. Now, as the, as the horizon is approached, time-like particles tends to be null, or the ordinary particle tends to be a photon. So should there be their sources. So as the time-like particles tends to be null, the source which produces that acceleration, grad pi, and the source which produces the curvature, they should also be equal. And that is why the non-gravitational gra gravitational energy uh, equipartition defines the black hole origin. This is a very illuminating insight, insightful principle. And let us see whether can we on similar thing understand something of the book Dalim. Next. <clears throat> so we say, could we similarly also define book Dal bound in terms of the gravitational field? And actually this was the point uh, which I emerged when we, when I had a chat with the Ritu some five or six years back. So let's just ask this question. Now the gravitational field energy is some constant times the non-gravitational energy. What happens? And demand that what should we beat ourselves that M or R is the Bukdal four by nine. And the answer comes out is the beta should be half. So what you say is that Bukdal bound or Bukdal sphere is defined by gravitational field energy being less than or equal to half of the uh, non-gravitational energy. 
Now he said, let us universalize this, that this should always be the case to define the book the bound. So make this as a general prescription. So, so again, let's verify it for the charged object. So this the, the, the gravitational field energy for the charged object is on the left, matter energy on the right, half of that. And that gives you M by R, the equation 17, which is the same what we obtained earlier by, by uh, Giolani and uh, Rothman uh, by following the Bogdal's procedure of matter density decreasing and charge density increasing. So finally we get the same, uh, same result. Now, this does not have to be. So there is something that this general principle is being uh, followed. So that's it. <clears throat> and here, of course, this this entire thing is all all these calculations, computations are done by using the exterior solution, which is unique. So we have and so equipartition of gravitational and non-gravitational energy defines black hole horizon, while the, the former being less than or equal to half of the latter defines the Bukdal compact sphere. So that's that's that. Yet we don't, in this case, we do not really understand what. Is there any physical reason for this factor being half? I don't. Know. So let's next. <clears throat> Again, you can go over to the uh, uh, pure love lock, and this thing simply follows the same form. So this is that uh, your brown York uh, energy you have, where phi is. M bar or n, and m bar is the m minus q squared by 2r for the uh, mass effective charge for the uh, charge object. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what, so then again, you demand the same thing that, that let, let beta be the factor between the, the gra gravitational field energy and the matter energy. That gives you that gives you phi as uh, equation twenty one two beta over one plus beta square. Next, <clears throat> you have five minutes, Naresh. I have five minutes. Oh, damn it! <laughs> so let's let, let's get get over to this. Uh, uh, okay, let, let, let's quickly get. Uh, <clears throat> Now, so this gives you that the phi, so following the Bukda limit, phi was determined as this, that the, the phi, the potential. If you, and here we obtain in terms from the gravitational field energy and non gravitational field as, as, as phi as this, and that determines beta. So beta gets determined this way where gamma is. So what really, is happening is that, and again, you will say beta is half for when n equal to one or d equal to four. And there is one very important thing is, or in all d equal to three n plus one, beta is four, half. Because in d equal to three n plus one, m phi is always m over r or that the gravitational potential always falls as one over R in D equal to three and plus one. Next. <clears throat> so another measure of the uh, compactness, give it be the, uh, your escape velocity. So let's consider a, a particle at rest following from infinity, 
what velocity will it acquire? The, the proper velocity relative to a static observer, that turns out to be is equal to twice the potential, two phi. And this is your same as the twice GS Newtonian. And it is for this reason that the Newtonian thing uh, also gives you the same R equal to two GM by C squared, that's what's your radius. One has always been wondering that uh, how does uh, this, uh, you get the same Schwarzschild radius from the Newtonian theory because of this, that the, in the radial fall, gravi gravi the, the Newtonian, the Einstein gravity plays no role because the gravitational field energy only curves the space. And the curvature of the space only you experience when you have a non radial motion. That is actually, so it's the, the, the curvature gives of the space gives you the perillion uh, shift. And otherwise, it is about it. So, Bugdal sphere is then always defined as, as this. So, this is you say the in a scale velocity. So given the n that, uh, and the d and the low log order of the polynomial, the, this, the v square is universal. That is, it is same for whether it is object is charged or uncharged. For n equal to one, d equal to four and five, v square is eight by nine and three by four. So now you say for four, it is eight by nine, for five, it is three by four. So as D increases, that escape velocity is decreasing. On the other hand, your compact, so-called the compactness ratio M by R, that increases because it is four by nine for four, for five, it is root three by eight, which is larger than four by nine, it is increasing. So now it is interesting to say, the compactness is determined by whom? The scale velocity or M by R? It stands to reason that more compact the object is, the scale velocity should be larger because the gravitational pull should become larger, so it, it should have this. So there is a scale velocity which really should be a true measure of compactness rather than M over R. Of course, in all dimension P equal to three and plus one, two are the same because they both are determined by the go as M over R. Next. Yeah, so recalling this, so you as a matter of fact, what you can say is in terms of the N, V square goes this for a large N, V tends to one or the black hole becomes, uh, the object turns into a black hole. So if the love lock order is increasing, of course with the love lock order, the D has automatically increased because dimension has always to be greater than or equal to one plus two, so this, so it becomes, so as n large, it becomes, uh, the velocity become one, turning to a, a black hole. Yeah, the, the, just two minutes, could you give me? Now the question is, uh, so, so here, uh, what do you, what we have here? So in general, this is what you will say that the scale velocity is universal for a fixed D and N. And it turns out that M over R extremal, that is for Q square by M square equal to one or whatever, or the, the not for, no, the here the extremality is Q square by M square is nine by eight. Uh, is twice of the Schwarzschild. Now this incidentally is more very remarkable 
the same result is for the black hole. The black hole extremal is greater than twice the Schwarzschild of, of uh, for the black M over R for the black hole. So that's <clears throat> so this is always. Now the thing is this that twice the gravitational field energy being equal to the uh, non gravitational energy, there has to be some underlying principle. This is what we don't really understand. And so, like as I understand the equipartition thing, there was a very physical reason for this. But for here, I don't understand. It's, one doesn't understand this. Uh, of course, they have, except that it all looks very nice because whatever that this uh, this extremal limit thing have a. Uh, for black hole, the same sort of a thing exists for the uh, your uh, for the the compact object. 